big news. I'm listening. What do you got? Critics and parents agree. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, is hilarious, action-packed, and fun for the whole family. How do you like me now? That's what I'm talking about. Paw Patrol, the mighty movie, rated PG, now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Hi, this is John O'Manton, and you're listening to my weekly mixtape with Brian Colburn. And this show is great because Brian does his homework, he knows what he's talking about, and he asks the deep and probing questions that you want to hear the answers to. Welcome to My Weekly Mixtape, a podcast that takes the classic mixtape approach to building a modern playlist. I'm your host, Brian Colburn. One of my favorite music scenes growing up was the New York City rock scene in the early 90s. As you may remember, I discussed this scene with Aaron Comas of the Spin Doctors a few weeks back. Well, tonight, I'm excited to continue exploring that scene with my guest, John O'Manson, who has a new duo album entitled Bootlegger Days that he recorded with yet another member of that New York City scene, John Popper of Blues Traveler. John, thank you so much for joining me on my weekly mixtape. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm pleased to be here. Well, John, to kick things off, I always like to ask first time guests, what does the word mixtape mean to you? Ah, well, you know, I'm 62 years old, so I grew up in the golden age of the mixtape, you know, at least as far as I'm concerned, where cassettes were king. And mixtape means uh, quite a number of things to me. On one hand, I used to make them for myself, putting together, like recording things either off the radio, because I had a, a radio, like a cassette player that could record off the radio. Like when, of course, a lot of those things, like the first couple seconds of the song weren't there because you heard the song you wanted to record you and you didn't have time to press <laughs> record in time, you know, and then later making them mixtapes off of LPs, you know, when I was really young doing that. And then, of course, finding early crushes, you know, with girls and trying to woo them with my fantastic and eclectic taste in music <laughs> and giving mixtapes to some girl who you really, you know, who I, I, I was also, I'm, I'm a pretty extroverted person now, but when I was a teenager, I was painfully shy. So it was easier for me to like some girl who was going away for the summer and I was hoping would think about me in some way while, while she was gone from, you know, while we were physically apart it was easier for me to like hand her a cassette tape and run away than to say anything <laughs> to her you know so and then during times in my life bandmates of mine would make mixtapes for me like for example i was in this band called joey miserable and the worms later just the worms for almost 10 years in new york and um that band, the other sort of co-frontman of that band was Simon Chartier, who's also still very active in New York. And he was like, and still is, a walking encyclopedia of early rock and roll. And so he would make mixtapes for me of stuff that he thought I should know about because he's he was born in 1958. So he's like three, four years older than me. And at that age, when you're in your early 20s, that age difference makes a difference. He was older than me. He knew more, you know, and so he would make these mixtapes for me and educate me about like 50s, like rockabilly and early R&B, like from the late 40s and early 50s. So mixtape means a lot to me. I mean, mixtapes played a big role in my life. Awesome. Well, for tonight's conversation, I'd first like to explore the musical relationship between you and John that leads us up to bootlegger days, sure. and then we'll dive into some of the highlights from this amazing album. Awesome. So to start, I want to go back to the late 80s, early 90s, as Blues Traveler cut their teeth in the New York City music scene by opening for the band that you just spoke about, Joey Miserable and the Worms. Could you start by giving the listeners an idea of what New York City's music scene was like in general during that time period, and then how the musical relationship with the guys from Blues Traveler came to fruition? Sure. You know, at that time, at the time when I started playing like in clubs in New York, the late 70s and early 1980s, there was sort of an explosion of live music, I think, on the heels of the whole you know, after the disco era, then came punk rock and new wave and a renewed interest in what we now call Americana. But back then there was a whole rockabilly revival and sort of roots music was once again, people were interested in hearing it. And 
there was an explosion of live music and live music venues in New York. Every like hole in the wall, you know, and some of them became very famous holes in the wall, like places like CBGB's and the Nightingale, where we used to play quite regularly, became sort of hubs of these various scenes. And I think that the whole punk rock thing was sort of the catalyst for that, because all of a sudden the DIY music spaces, little bars that didn't that, that any place that where you could stick a band in the corner wanted people to play. And people were thirsty for live music and, and not cover bands. Everyone wanted to hear something new and different and original. And I think that was sort of the spawning ground for the the sort of rebirth of the sort of what became the jam band scene that grew out of that in the mid 80s into the 90s and my band the worms we used to we used to sort of hold court at nightingale very regularly and this for those of you out there who never went there it was a small funky dive bar that probably legally was able to have like maybe a hundred people in there but they would shoehorn maybe 300 a night in there i mean it was so jam-packed that and it would be so hot and sweaty that i remember like the ceiling used to sweat like people sweat would like go up to the ceiling condense and drip back down i mean it was funky but in the best sense of that word you know and john popper you know is a year older than the other founding members of Blues Traveler. So he graduated high school before them. And so they were still in high school, but he was free to roam before the other three guys were, before, you know, Bobby Chan and Brendan were able to roam. So John started kind of poking around before Blues Traveler really started coming across from, they were all still living in, in New Jersey and Princeton. And so I remember meeting John earlier on and he would come and ask to sit in. And of course, he was phenomenal back then as a harmonica player. And then the following year, Blues Traveler as a band sort of made the move to New York. You know, they moved to New York and it's kind of the fairy tale story for them. They moved to New York and all moved into one apartment together in Brooklyn and, you know, to make it as a band. And you are correct when you say that some of their earliest gigs were opening for us at places like the Nightingale because we had a large following and they were great already. They were really good. They were they, they were still, you know, in their formative stage, but they already had some of the songs that later became famous tunes for them. But anyway, and songs like that from their earlier repertoire. And John was always such a phenomenal instrumentalist, soloist and frontman that people were immediately attracted to him. So that's my earliest memories of seeing them play and hearing them play and interacting with them. And we all kind of became friends and collaborators very early on. Well, over the years, you guys played a lot of gigs together. And then you actually started a side project with members of the band called High Plains Drifter, which featured both Chan Kinchla and Bobby Sheehan from Blues Traveler, as well as at one point, Eric Shankman from the Spin Doctors, who was filling in for Chan. Can you talk about what brought this group together and the legacy that they formed amongst fans who were lucky to see this New York City scene supergroup in action? <laughs> the band actually started in 1992. I moved out away from New York to New Mexico, where I still live today in Santa Fe. And I'm the New York outpost. At the, I'm like, you know, so like they sent me out, like Kevin Costner in Dances with Wolves. They sent me to the outpost. And so Bobby and Chan, used to, Bobby in particular used to come out here and visit with me and we would jam and do musical projects and sometimes play gigs here. And both of those guys, Bobby and Chan, really liked to, in the off times, go and like hang out and play gigs in the Colorado ski towns. Cause of course, Colorado has always been a hotbed also for the jam band world, you know, Red Rocks is there and just the whole culture there and the vibe is very conducive to that kind of music. And so they've, the initial seed for putting that band together, they approached me and said, how about we put this band together? Me, you know, Bobby and Chan and me and Mark Clark, who's a drummer, from New Mexico, who I started working with when I moved out here, who I'm still working with all the time to this day, 30 plus years later. And the initial impetus for putting it together was so that we could get these gigs up in like Vail and Aspen and Breckenridge and Steamboat Springs, all the, the ski towns in the winter when Blues Traveler had breaks in their schedule. And we'd go up there and play these gigs. There were great gigs and super cool venues. And then the guys could go skiing and party and do all the fun stuff that you can do up in Colorado. So it was kind of like 
Blues Traveler was already extremely busy and beca- had already become a very popular and big touring act, but they wanted to have something on the side that would feel less pressureful for them. That would be like, okay, we're doing this for fun. And that doesn't mean we didn't, from the get-go, take the music very seriously, which we did. So I was sort of the front guy for that band. And as you mentioned, Shankman was also a revolving member of the band. And John Popper used to come and be on gigs too. And as well as like Warren Haynes would sometimes come and sit in with us and a bunch of other people from that scene. And it started to build momentum and we started to do gigs elsewhere not just for these like wintertime sort of fun break vacation and that's where the name high plains drifter came from because new mexico is is in the high plains and so uh, that's why we we chose that name and then you know after a while um this is right around the time that blues traveler 4 was just coming out and their relationship the band's relationship with a&m records was such that they came, they, Bobby and Chan, or I think Bobby in particular, went to the suits at AM and and said, you know, we have this side project that we'd like to make a record with, if that's possible. And a and checked out what we were doing and gave us a budget to make a record. And But they didn't, for legal reasons, they didn't want the record to be called High Plains Drifter because there was too many. The, anytime the lawyers at the label say, oh, we've got this too much red tape to do to get permission to use that name, then we could get sued, blah, blah, blah. Call it the John O'Manson Band. You know, John owns his name. There's going to be no problem with that, which, of course, we were fine with. And so that's how that record got made for A&M in back in 1996. That album, Almost Home, kicks off with the song that actually introduced me to your music. The first one's free and also (laughs) included amazing tracks such as Talk to You, which features Warren Haynes, like you mentioned, Sad State of Affairs, and Miss Fabulous, which was featured on both the Almost Home album, as well as on the soundtrack to a little movie called Kingpin. I've always wondered, the songs on Almost Home, those were High Plains Drifter tracks, or was that stuff that you guys wrote after the deal with A&M came together? Many of those songs were songs that we had in our repertoire. And then a handful of them were tunes that I had laying around that we decided to record for one reason or another. And we made that record pretty quickly. I mean, we had a, we had a limited, and it's not like it wasn't a, a rush job, but because those guys were busy, we all had our, our other other commitments, especially them. So we chose material that we felt like fit the band. But yeah, but some of those things like Miss Fabulous was certainly a song that we were already playing with High Plains Drifter. One Horse Town, uh, which is a ballad on that record, is another one that we are first ones free. We were already playing with High Plains Drifter. And then the rest of them were songs that I had written or other guys. There's a couple songs written by Joe Flood, uh, who was another member of our scene, you know. And so we just picked material that we felt fit our vibe, you know, and that we could record well. And and that's how the, the choice of material for that record came about. And also Mike Barbiero, who produced the album, weighed in and we gave him a bunch of tunes to listen to. And he weighed in on which he thought were the 10 strongest to record. I think he, he was on to something because it's definitely a fantastic album. Thank you. You're welcome. And for someone who's never had the privilege to have any of my songs on a major motion picture soundtrack, from the business side of things, I'd love to know, considering how popular Kingpin was amongst my age group at that time, did you as an artist see a tangible impact from having Miss Fabulous featured in the movie and on the soundtrack? Yeah. I mean, Miss Fabulous is one of the songs on the album that I didn't write. Uh, Joe Flood wrote that song. So when you're when you're the recording artist, you also get some some dough from it. But like the publishing money, the writer's money goes to the writer of the song. But I've also had songs of mine that I've written in other major motion pictures, too. And so I can attest to the fact that the initial impact in terms of getting a, a little chunk of change from the movie is great. <laughs> and then the residual effect of the exposure that you get from having your song in a movie like that can be very far reaching in ways that you don't expect. Like, for example, I'll give you a for example. Uh, this is from a different thing. I had a song, the song Almost Home, uh, which is a title track of the album Almost Home. A different recording of that song was used in a Kevin Costner movie called The Postman. Oh. And I'm actually in the film singing it. 
you know, and The Postman was a very long sort of post-apocalyptic thriller that didn't do that well in the box office. It was not it wasn't it wasn't a critical success, but Tom Petty's in the movie, too. It's pretty fun. I got to hang with him when we were making the movie. But wow. the point is that that song and also Miss Fabulous in Kingpin turned a lot of people onto my music. I still to this day get emails from people say I discovered you because of Kingpin, you know, and this song Almost Home in the Coster movie. Like at one point, I got an email from these musicians in Pakistan. Right. And they're young. These guys weren't even alive when that movie came out saying, you know, we love your music and we're fans of you because of your appearance in this film. And we want you to collaborate with us. And I won't go into the all the details, but it wound up being it's a collaboration that continues to this day that started like 10 years ago. And I wound up going to Pakistan and recording with these guys and having all kinds of crazy adventures, things that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had that song in a movie. So, and especially now in today's landscape of the music business where, you know, it's in the digital world, of course, it's getting harder and harder to get paid <laughs> for your music once it's been released. You know, the whole Spotify and streaming conundrum is getting synchronization, you know, namely having your your songs coupled with moving images of some sort or another, either, either on films or on television, is one of the last frontiers for us who make and who write and record music to get it out there in a really meaningful way that sometimes just self-releasing or putting out our songs just as audio doesn't have the same impact. So it's great anytime that happens. Well, I want to jump on something you had just mentioned, because one of the reasons I haven't become an all in guy on streaming is because some albums just don't exist on Apple music or Spotify and personally, I think it's a crime that Almost Home is not on there. Thankfully, I still have my original CD to spin whenever I want. Yeah, it's something that I need to explore because in theory, the masters for that album are owned by Universal, who bought A&M. And I don't, I don't know what, that, what, I, what I legally need to do to get permission to just release it on my own. And I need to explore that. I need to talk to my attorney. And get her to to investigate on my behalf. When you're in this kind of conundrum, the two things to do are either talk to your attorney and to get them to go contact people and go through channels, or just put it out and see if you get a <laughs> see if someone contacts you with a cease and desist. You know, because even though I am the artist on that and wrote the lion's share of those songs, et cetera, et cetera. You know, when a record company pays to have an artist record something, they own the master recordings. They actually own, they don't necessarily own the songs. I could re-record those songs if I wanted to at this point, but those particular recordings are not my property. So yeah, it's a good point you make, Brian. I need to, I need to find out about that and I'll keep you posted because I think a lot of people would be happy if that record were streamable. Yeah. And you also talked about other songs that didn't make the final cut if they're still available maybe a deluxe anniversary edition i'm just there throwing that go. out there i do have some outtakes lurking so yes all right well i do want to go back prior to almost home you appeared as a guest on blues travelers smash album four as a guest vocalist on the album's closing track brother john can you talk about how that all came together yeah i was in new york it was, this was in 1990 you know, whatever, 1994, 95, when they were recording that record. And I was in New York working on an album of my own. I'd already moved to Santa Fe, but I was back in New York working on a record. And Popper came out and played on my record that I was working on. And I can't remember which happened first. Uh, either I, he came to, to the studio I was working in, but the guys called me up and said, you know, we're working on this album at Electric Lady. And there's this one song where we need like a, somebody else to sing at the end. And we thought it'd be great if you would do it. So, of course, I went to the studio. There's Electric Lady Studios on A Street in Manhattan, Jimi Hendrix's studio. And who wouldn't go? Of who wouldn't do that? <laughs> and uh, and I think I got there like they were they were working late hours. I got there like 11 o'clock at night or something. And I don't think we recorded that track until like three in the morning or something. And I remember they had already recorded Run Around and I heard that and 
they had also just recorded Hook. Uh, and John was like, check this out. Check out this song, Hook. It's Pachelbel's Canon. And I <laughs> sing all the horn parts and everything. I made these lyrics and it's really cool. And I think it's going to be great. And uh, so I'm like one of the first people who heard either of those tunes, which of course became, and, and, and of course, one of my favorite blues travel songs of all time, Mountains Win Again, is on that record. And uh, I don't think I heard Mountains when I was in the studio with them doing my vocals on Brother John, but I heard did hear Run Around and Hook and got the sense right away that this was going to be a breakthrough for them because they were already popular. They had already developed a very rabid following just because of their relentless touring, but they hadn't really broken through big time commercially. And th I could tell that the way this record was sounding, that this was their chance. And sure enough, it was. And um, over here behind the camera over there on the wall, I've got my platinum album wow. award for having for having been a part of that record you know and uh i didn't get paid to sing <laughs> you know <laughs> they're my friend so that platinum album award and like 375 will get me a latte at starbucks <laughs> but uh but you know it was one of those things it goes back to our i'm just joking you know we we all used to do everything to help one another and like i said during that same week john came out and played on my record and i didn't pay him either <laughs> so, so you know it was all about collaboration and that's one of the earmarks of the scene that we came from there was no sense of competition whatsoever you know there was no sense of territorial being guarded about, you know, oh, if these guys come, they're going to steal my gig or this or that. There was some, there was enough to go around and nobody cared. And it was really, I'm very fortunate. And so are those guys. We all are. The people that came out of that scene to have learned that way and to have to go forth into the world with that sense of giving, which I do every day here in my studio in Santa Fe. I, you know, when I'm working with other artists, be they established bands or emergent young artists or emergent old artists, you know, that sense of like investing of yourself in other people's interests is, I think, was instilled in me back in those days. Well, I want to jump off. You mentioned one of your favorite songs from Blues Traveler. It happens to be one of mine as well. The Mountains Win Again. And I want to time jump here because in 2008, you sang on a version of the mountains win again for the band's cover yourself album, which was True. a very interesting release for me as a blues traveler fan, because they took some big chances and liberties in rearranging their most popular songs for you as the singer. What was it like stepping into the studio to try to put your stamp on a song that was so widely known and beloved? Well, you know, the advantage of that particular version was that they had already sort of reinvented the arrangement to a point where I didn't feel like I had to replicate, you know, John's original vocal performance on that song. You know, that song is also very dear to me because, you know, Bobby Sheehan wrote mm -hmm. it. Yes. Um, and I remember the night and I also performed that song at Bobby's funeral. Wow. Because John was too, wasn't able, he was too broken up to sing. And so at Bobby Sheen's funeral at St. Anne's Church in Brooklyn, John and Chan and I performed the song and I sang it, you know. So so that song has a deep significance for me personally. And I also remember the night on a High Plains Drifter tour, we were in Boulder and at we played the Fox Theater in Boulder and Bobby came to my room after the gig and he had he had written the lyric for mountains win again and he wanted to show it to me to get my opinion if because he he wasn't a songwriter in the band he didn't write the lyrics you know he participated in writing the music but he up until then wasn't lyricist in the band and he was very self-conscious about presenting the song you know and he, he read at that point there was no music to it but he had written the lyric. I can remember like looking at the piece of paper with his handwriting on it. And he, I read the lyric and he, you know, I told him that, yes, this is a very good lyric. You know, it was, it was deeply personal and also very poetic. You know, I pick up my smile and put it in my pocket, you know, hold it for a while and you know, try not to have to drop it, you know, and the way also the poetry of it is very, simple in the sense that it's not you can tell that he's not trying to be 
clever or have a clever turn of a phrase. It's just naturally coming out of him. So that was a very meaningful thing for me to be asked to sing on that that new recording of that song. Awesome story. I have goosebumps just just hearing those those lyrics that they they mean so much to me just as a fan. I, I can't sure. even imagine. That was such a wonderful story. It's all true too. I didn't yeah. even make up any of it. <laughs> Now I want to jump ahead to 2011, where you were the producer, recording engineer, mixing engineer, guitarist, vocalist, and primary songwriter for John Popper and the Dusk Ray Troubadours album. God, I just I get tired just hearing you say that. <laughs> <laughs> as soon as you hear the opening track on the album, Love Has Made It So, you immediately grasp that this album is bringing together the sounds that you've brought to your solo material throughout the years and then adding in John's distinctive vocal and harmonica delivery, it's a perfect musical marriage, if you ask me. Songs like Something Sweet and Shampipple, Ooze with R&B and Americana, and then you add in that southern rock groove of Don't Tread on Me. It's such a wonderful album. Can you talk about how this project came together? Because the songs feel so natural listening to the album. It was almost as if these songs were honed on the stage for years prior to the recording. Yeah, which is not the case at all. Some of the songs were actually written in the studio, you know, when we were recording. And we recorded that not in the studio that I'm in now, but in my former studio here in, in New Mexico, which is up this, I built a studio in this rambling old funky adobe house up in the hills north of Santa Fe in a place called Chupadero, New Mexico. And um, yeah, John approached me about, doing this side project and part of his interest in doing it besides the fact that we had talked about doing something like this for many years was that he was very interested in doing more collaborative songwriting outside of the context of blues traveler and sure enough in subsequent blues traveler albums like uh, blow up the moon mm -hmm. and stuff that he brought in other writers and this i think this doing the dust gray project was sort of a launching pad for him in terms of getting into that world because for, for many, many, many years since the beginning of the band, he was sort of the, saddled with being the primary songwriter. So I think it was liberating for him to be able to come to me and trust me enough to say, okay, I've got these songs, I've got these ideas. And we got together, we had two primary writing sessions, one down in Austin where he and I and Aaron Beavers from the band Sherman, who is also in the Dusk Gray Troubadour band, mm -hmm. got together and start. We each came with our bits and pieces, our scrap bin, if you will, of song ideas, half-baked ideas. I've got a verse idea. I've got a lyric. I've got a song title. That's cool. We should write us, you know, and started bouncing things around for maybe three or four days. And then we had a second writing session in New York where John and I spent – a few days together working on tunes and also Chris Barron from the spin doctors joined us. And we wrote uh, in one afternoon in John's hotel room where he was staying. And uh, we wrote Sham Pipple that day, the three of us, which is probably the most popular song from that record, the most requested at least, which is, you know, it's a really fun song and it's about, you know, Fred Sanford's favorite beverage, which was ginger ale and ripple Sham Pipple. And, um, so the songs came about like that. And then we assembled the band. We decided who would be in the band. Uh, Mark Clark from the High Plains Drifter group, a uh, bass player named Steve Lindsay, Aaron Beavers, and then Kevin Trainer, who is also uh, plays on the new record, Bootlegger Days, who was also from our scene in New York. He was the front man for a band called the Surreal McCoys, which was an amazing, amazing band during the 80s and early 90s in New York. And uh, so it brought kind of a lot of threads together. New people that I was working with out here in New Mexico. John had met Aaron Beavers down in Austin. Um, and Sherman had his band Sherman had toured with Blues Traveler. So I didn't know Aaron, but John was like, you know, you should get we should get this guy Aaron to be in the band because he he'll bring like the Texas thing into the group. And you know, so we so he balanced the the sort of the New Mexico, New York, Texas thing. And and that's how it happened. And it was very organic process. We recorded the album in about two weeks and uh, set everything up in this studio uh, that I had. And yeah, I, I love that record and I loved working on it and you know you're right it has a very kind of rootsy americana sound and that's what we were going for we had decided that that was going to be the vibe 
of the record and we succeeded. Yeah. I mean, it's uh, I, it's been a while since I've listened to it. I should, I should revisit it every time I, I happen to hear one of the songs from that record. I, I really enjoy it, but I haven't listened to it front to back in a long time. Well, if you don't mind, I have one small quip about the Dusk Ray Troubadours album, and this is going to be where my music nerddom comes into full effect. So I apologize in advance. Go ahead. I am a huge fan of Frogwing's Croakin' It Toads album that John recorded alongside of Kofi and Oteil Burbridge, Butch and Derek Trucks, Jimmy Herring, and Mark Quinones. Now, for the Dusk Gray Troubadours album, the band recorded a studio version of my favorite Frogwing song, Hurdy Gurdy Fandango, but it was right. only released as a bonus track on the iTunes edition of the album. So I had to settle for buying it in its <clears throat> lossy MP3 format. And I've been forever since <laughs> praying for a deluxe version of this album. So I could finally get that version on lossless or CD. So I'm curious why that song was saved for an iTunes bonus track. Cause you guys really knocked it out of the park. I, I like that track too. A lot. La, 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 la. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know why. I, I don't re- at least I knew at the time. I don't remember what the reasoning was. I think the label wanted a certain number of tunes and they wanted to hold back something for a bonus track on the digital release. You know, don't forget this is going back to 2011 where the sort of transition into like mm-hmm. the streaming world was just happening. And I think everyone was trying to navigate how to best take advantage of that and attract people to the various versions of the album. So I think some of that went into the thinking with the people at the label 429 was the name of the label that put it out in terms of keeping like a strong song off the record and having it be available on just for, if you were going to buy the record on iTunes, because back then people were actually paying to download records, you Mm know, it wasn't all just streaming. So I think that's probably what the reasoning was, although I don't know how directly involved I was in that part of the process. You know, that very often happens where the band and or the producer, the creative producers of the record aren't necessarily directly involved with some of the decisions that of those sorts that get made after the fact. So that's all I can tell you. But you're right. It's a very strong Uh, It's a very strong um, and it's funny because my daughter, who when we recorded that album was only two years old, now plays the hurdy gurdy. She has one and she she's taught herself to play it. And so I I thought I all of a sudden went, you know, it dawned on me about six months ago. I was like, you know what? We and she knows John, you know, and I said, John and I once recorded a song about a hurdy gurdy player. She's like, no. (laughs) <laughs> and I played it for she goes, well, how come you never so she's so she like you shares shares the uh dissatisfaction at the fact that she had to wait so long to hear that song. Amen. Amen. Well, as I was getting ready for tonight's episode, I realized something on your site that I didn't know for the last 11 years. You were a songwriter for something on Blues Traveler's 2012 album Susie Cracks the Whip. And I have the two CD deluxe version that Best Buy sold disc two doesn't come with any liner notes. So oh. I have no clue what song you wrote with the band that I'd love to learn it's, more about your involvement with that album. It's washed away with tears. Is really? The the song. Yeah. And the, the single from that, that's that, um, what's, what was the lead off track? What's the name of it on, on the main disc? Oh, you, uh, you don't have to love me. You don't have to love me. Yeah. Aaron, who was, you know, also in the dust grade, wrote that song. And so at that, when they were doing Susie Cracks the Whip, again, John was, and I also had, I'm involved in yet another song on that record. Uh, But yeah, I had written, so John was like, yeah, we're, 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 you know, I'm open to co-writing and or considering material from people in my circle to be included on this record. Because, like I said, uh, you don't have to love me. It was written, you know. John had had no hand in writing it. It was written by Aaron Beavers. So I sent John. I had this song that I had started writing called "Washed Away with Tears," and it was a ballad. Like I could, if I dug up the original demo of that, I've got it somewhere lurking. It was a ballad. It was the same melody, 
that's on the thing and uh, uh, some of the same lyrics because I hadn't finished writing it. You know, I sent him this song idea. I had written the chorus and had a couple verse ideas and I sent it to John. I was like, what do you think about this? And he wrote me back or called me. I can't remember what and said, oh, I love that song. If you mind, if you don't mind, I'll run with it. You know, it's like, dude, go ahead. It's going to be a, it's going to be on a blues traveler record. You can, you know, do what you like, you know? And uh, so I wound up with the co-write and the, the, when I finally heard blues travel, I don't know if I even heard blues Traveler's version until the album came out. I, I think I might even have to go to Best Buy to get it. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can find it on, it's on YouTube and stuff. You can hear the version. And I'll be sure to embed it on the episode page over at myweeklymixtape.com for anyone who's listening and want to go directly to the song. And the other thing that I did was I recorded Crystal Bowersox's vocal for I Don't Want to Go. Is that the name of the song that she sings on? Yes. I don't want to go. I want to hold your hand in the night of our land. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, which I think John co-wrote with Carrie Rodriguez. And it's funny because Crystal... I've done a lot of work with her, both as a co-writer and produced some of her music. And John called Crystal and said, hey, we're working on this album and we want you to sing this duet with me because we think your voice would be perfect for this. And can you get into a studio sometime soon? And she it was at that time she was living in Portland, Oregon. And at that moment, she was in her car on her way to New Mexico to work with me in my studio. You know, so she said, yeah, I think I can find a studio with someone who, you know, you know, so they sent me the track and I cut Crystal's vocal on that. So I'm I've got my hand in that record in a couple of spots. Very you know? cool. Very awesome. I love her vocal track on that album, by the way. It's such a yeah. wonderful duet between the two. Their voices marry perfectly together. She is an awesome singer on my current uh, solo album which came out in March it's called Stars Enough to Guide Me we have a duet Crystal and I it's called Before We Get Stupid is, an, is the name of the song and it's like you know it's kind of just a dumbass good time rock and roll song about you know what happens sometimes between consenting adults yeah you know? dumbass so, I think it's one of the best songs on the album I love well, it I, I, I don't mean dumbass as a negative <laughs> thing you know yes that I don't mean to say that dumbasses, you know, some of the, some of the greatest songs ever written are pretty stupid, you know, so it's like stupid. Not, I mean, you know, it's not trying to say anything deep and poignant. It just, it's not social commentary or anything. It's just about having fun and partying and the human condition, you know, so. There you go. Stars Enough to Guide Me, like you said, came out in March. It's an amazing listen. And three songs into the album, there's a duet with some guy, John Popper, who we've talked about in this hour called New Kind of Blue, which right. is a refreshing folk Americana jam song. Where does this song sit in the timeline for recording bootlegger days? Was this something that helped lead to this duo album? Or was this a song that maybe was recorded for that album, but then you moved it to stars enough to guide me kind of what's the story behind this? It one? wasn't so much recorded for that album, but it was recorded during the same sessions as bootlegger days. You are right. Your yeah. detective work is paying off. It's very yeah. sonically similar. Yeah. And it's the same band. Same same band that's on Bootlegger Days. But this one, unlike the songs on Bootlegger Days, which are all sung by John. And as a matter of fact, at the beginning, the idea when we made Bootlegger Days was that it was going to be a John Popper album that I was co-writing and producing. But then because of my extensive involvement in this particular record, it was John who kind of stepped up and said, you know, this should be your name should be on the cover, too. You know, and uh, to which I did not object. And, you know, I'll take half the blame for, <laughs> for this one. But that song, as you point out, is a duet between the two of us. And and I sing plenty on bootlegger days, but I, my role there is more as a backing and harmony vocal. I don't sing any lead vocals on the album because initially it was supposed to just be a John Popper solo project. And because of the fact that my involvement in the project is so multi-pronged um, <laughs> that, that we decided mutually I mean, at John's suggestion to put my name on the cover. Well, the album entitled Bootlegger Days features yourself on electric guitar, tenor guitar, banjo, background vocals, 
John on lead vocals and harmonica, Kevin Trainer, who you mentioned earlier from the Dusk Ray Troubadours on electric and acoustic guitar, Ronnie Johnson on bass, Mark mm. Clark, who you've talked about several times tonight on drums and percussion, and Jason Crosby on piano, organ, electric piano, and violin. With you, yeah. John, Mark, and Kevin together, was there ever a sense that this could be the follow up or sequel? two Dusk Ray Troubadours, or was this a different mindset altogether? Um, well, it's not a different mindset altogether. I mean, we're we're writing songs and figuring out how to arrange and record them, which is our usual mindset. But thematically and energetically, we wanted this record to be more sort of steeped in blues and R&B as opposed to Americana, you know? And we didn't want to write like a straight blues album where every song was like a 12 bar blues. Although there is there is a little bit of that on the record. There's a song called uh, Same Old Blues, which is just like a straight sort of Texas shuffle. And then there's a, another tune called New Cocaine Blues, which is pretty much a blues tune. And uh, it's funny because. We decided to call the song New Cocaine Blues because there, there are there is a song called Cocaine Blues. Uh, like yes. cocaine running around my brain. And like but John was like, Wow, people are gonna think, wow, there's a new cocaine. <laughs> uh, it's like, no, it's the same old it's shit. Like, it's like new coke. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There's a new coke. All of the pitfalls with a brand new flavor. Uh you'll still lose it, your house anyway. But but um so we wanted to, we wanted it to be musically a little bit more on the blues and R&B side of the spectrum, which it is. And then also in Bootlegger Days, it's not really a concept album per se, but as we were starting to write the songs, we started to see like some, you know, all sort of unbeknownst to us, there were some underlying themes or like, you know, storylines that was sort of coming out during the writing of some of the songs and so as we started to see some of the connections between the songs we then as we were working on subsequent material for the album made a conscious effort to include so if you listen carefully to the album you can hear uh it's a bonus for people who pay close attention there are cross references in quite a number of the songs um there's sort of a character that is introduced in the first song of the album who's sort of this hard luck character. The first song of the album is about this hard luck character who has gotten in too deep with these bookies that he now owes 10 grand to. And this is back in the prohibition days. So $10,000 is a lot of money. And it's about how he has to like escape them. And it's like almost the first song I wrote it. And it's kind of like a gangster movie in four minutes. You're talking about before the heat rolls in, correct? That's correct. Yeah. Right. And so this character who appears in, before the heat rolls in is actually the protagonist to some extent in some of the other tunes and some of the references in that first song come up in small ways in other places in the album. And I don't want to give too much of it away because that would spoil all the fun, but we had fun with that. And then there are a handful of tunes that are unrelated to that storyline um, that we just thought were good songs. So, so we put them in, but there is sort of a, theme of hard luck and perhaps redemption maybe not <laughs> you know it, that runs throughout well i love that texas blue swagger of the three songs you mentioned new cocaine blues the same old blues and before the heat rolls in now the next song i want to highlight is a country stomper which is the second track on the album following up before the heat rolls in and that's who's taking care of the road which features beautiful harmony vocals from mirney fowler to me, yeah. this is a very interesting choice of track to follow up before the heat rolls in because it kind of sets the tone for the album, which I feel is this cornucopia of musical influences coming together in apologies for the bad pun, but, you know, perfect harmony, so to speak. Yeah. When you guys were working on these songs, was that always the intention or were you guys just saying, here's something I came up with, let's write it and see where it goes? It was more the latter, but we wrote more songs than wound up being on the album. And we actually recorded more songs than wound up being on the album. We have some outtakes that are completely mixed that sometime before too long, we'll definitely see the light of day nice. uh, in, in one form or another. But that's actually one of my very favorite tracks on the album, because that was one that like uh, John had sent me. We wrote the album. First off, we wrote the album in we started writing it in December of 2020. 
like at the height of the pandemic lockdown. So we did the initial writing long distance, you know. So I said, you know, John, just go through your because John, like when he has ideas, he like writes them in his notes on his iPhone or whatever. And I said, go through your scrapping and just send me anything you want, you know, anything you've got. And who's taking care of the road when I'm gone was uh, just a line that he sent me. That was the only thing, you know. And then I started working on the tune. And to me, it sounded like, you know, the, the song is reminiscent of like, uh, you know, somebody robbed the Danville train or one of those kind of tunes. You know, it's got a classic form where it's like uh, the first line repeats several times and then there's a payoff line, like like a classic sort of country blues tune. It reminds me of like something Chris Ledoux would have done in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, that's certainly a, also a valid reference. It's that kind of stuff. And it also, to an extent, could relate to this same character, you know, because he's in the first song, he's trying to split town, you know, so so who's taking care? And the whole idea of like, it's sort of a play on words, like who's taking care of the road when I'm gone? So like, who's taking care of the road that I'm traveling on? Or who's taking care of the road that I'm leaving behind, you know, when I go, you know? And again, I don't want to give away too much about the song. You all can listen for yourselves right now. And Mirny is a great singer. Mirny Fowler, she's a great, great singer who lives here in Santa Fe. She's a local musician here who I call into the studio quite often when I need female background vocals on stuff, harmony vocals. And she's a great lead singer in her own right. But she's one of those great studio singers in the sense that she knows how to like really lock in with the lead singer and sing in not just perfect harmony, but also sort of assume that person's personality and really lock in. So, and she sings at, with the exception of one line at the very end of the song, she sings every note of the song along with John. Right. And it really adds just also the, having the, a female vocal on this. That's the only female voice on the, on the album, you know, and to, to have her along with him on, on that lyric adds a whole nother layer to it to me. And I thought that that would be really cool. I, Cause I, for, first I think, well, maybe I'll harmonize with John on this one, but like, no, it should be a woman. It should be a female vocal. Cause that adds, again, I don't want to give away too much, but there's some things that in the lyric that may give it more significance if it's sung by a man and a woman together. The next song I want to highlight from the album is what I consider a jazz R and B fusion with old school country. And that is your crazy. Mm. John, who's known to hit some high stratospheric upper register notes vocally, goes to the complete other side of the spectrum here, delivering some really deep and ethereal vocal runs, showing off a side of his voice that I don't think people normally associate with him. So to me, this song really stuck out from the whole album, and it really exudes this modern Americana feel but simultaneously takes you back to a completely different era of music. Was that the intention you were looking for in this song? Yes, absolutely. John's vocal performance on that song is also one of my favorites. And he was sort of channeling, if you listen to like early R&B, like, you know, the precursors of like the pop R&B tunes, like by groups like the Ink Spot or people like mm -hmm. that, the way those guys used to sing, going up, I can't even do it. But these high runs that they would do, you know, it's kind of where John was going with his with his vocal performance on that tune. The song itself, the whole vibe of it, with the sort of like this, it got a, sounds like, to me, I wanted the production of that song to sound like it's after hours in the speakeasy, the place is closed. I guess it's always after hours in a speakeasy, but <laughs> uh, but the place is closed. It's full of like blue with cigarette smoke. The piano player is sitting in it there. Jason played some amazing piano on that too. His piano playing on that tune is great. You know, and the way the band, if you ever saw the film To Have and Have Not with Humphrey Bogart and Lauren, Lauren Bacall, in the, there are several scenes where Hoagie Carmichael and his band play in that film and Lauren Bacall sings with them the song, how little we know, which was written by Hoagie Carmichael. And I kind of, that's obviously predates the early fifties era that I was talking about. And this goes back to like, you know, this is the early days that movie takes place in the late 1930s. It'd be the very beginning of, of world war two, but that vibe 
of the how the band, if you ever watch that film, how the band in that film interacts. And, they're, and again, they're playing in like this smoky bar in the lobby of this funky hotel in Martinique, you know, and that was kind of what I was going for. That feeling of just sort of like the old timey and the, the musicians are sort of feeling each other and interacting in that sort of organic way. Um, and I think we got it, you know, and the song itself sounds like a breakup song between a guy and his partner. But if you listen to the lyric carefully, it's actually a breakup song between the singer and a certain the former president of the United States, um, ho hopefully not uh, soon to be the next president of the United States. But if you listen to the lyric with that in mind, that's what the song was initially written about. But it can be taken completely at face value. But if you should listen to it again and think about, you know, I don't want to bring politics into the discussion, but, uh, <laughs> but, but I did, but, um, if you listen to it with that in mind, you'll see what I mean. Well, the next song up, you also released a video visualizer for, which is Cabin Fever. And this one, I want to focus on something that you're doing in the track, because John's vocals are layered against a banjo that you're playing throughout the song. And I mm -hmm. feel like it really adds a signature sound and tension to this track. And it, it makes it a standout for me. What gave you the idea to kind of follow the vocal melody with the banjo or was that the other way around? Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that they're sort of interconnected, you know, it's one of those songs. I wanted it to have that, um, you know, and again, in the first song in before the heat rolls in there's a line, of the song that goes 1200 miles to Baton Rouge. I know a cabin up in the woods. We make it there. We're gone for good. Right. And then at the end of the song, before the heat rolls in, you know, there's blood on the money, blood on the ground, you know, it could be yours or maybe mine, run out of luck, run out of time. So at the end of the song, before the heat rolls in, our hero and his gun mall sidekick are in deep trouble and we don't know who's been shot or what's happened. But then several songs later in the album, this guy, the singer of the song, is alone in a cabin right now. It could be the same cabin that the guy in the first song is talking about. Maybe yes, maybe no. And he talks about, you know, cabin fever setting and he's hallucinating, you know, and I can see you through the window, but I cannot touch your skin. Is it a ghost who stands before me or cabin fever setting in? So maybe, just maybe, it's the same guy from the first song who did make it there, but maybe she didn't. You know, so I don't know, could be. And so I wanted the song to have that sort of high and lonesome feeling, like almost like, you know, well, in the first song, he's trying to make it to Louisiana somewhere in the remote swamps or up in the woods of Louisiana to this cabin to hide out. So I wanted the song to have sort of a high lonesome feel to it. So I decided to play and I'm banjo is not my instrument. So, you know, it's, it's a very simple banjo part, but it fits the song. And so the idea of that kind of melody, that kind of song, very often like those Appalachian folk songs, the vocal melody, like a fiddle or a banjo mm -hmm. will be mirroring the vocal melody. Yes. And the two sort of dance together. So that's what I was going for, you know, and whether it was one leading the other, I don't know. They just sort of go together. Love it. Well, the last track I want to discuss is my current favorite song on the album, the infectious head bobbing jam rocker cover my hands. Mm. This song has a blistering harmonica solo, a tasty guitar solo, and musically it brings me full circle to the almost home and four albums. You and I were talking about earlier in the night. If you guys were touring this album to me, this is the show opening track. And speaking of touring, you have some shows coming up this fall with Blues Traveler. Yes. Are there any plans to break out some of these songs during those shows? Yes. I think the plan as of now, I can't confirm 100% is that I'll be doing my opening set. And then during Blues Traveler set, I will join the band and we will perform one of the songs from Bootlegger Days. That's part of the plan. 
And I agree with you that Cover My Hands, as a matter of fact, at one point, that was going to be the album opener. And I know what you're saying. It's like the kick off the show kind of song because of the way the introduction happens. Yes. It's got that guitar intro, you know, and it's uh, it's kind of draws you in. And you're right. It groove wise. It's the one that connects most with sort of like the earlier blues traveler and the roots rock kind of sounds that we used to all do. It's definitely the most connected to that. And that was also kind of conscious. And again, if you listen to the lyric of that song, in my mind, the guy who's singing that song is like, is now like lost. And it's like, he's speaking to somebody, right? Cause he keeps saying boys. He's like talking to his, these guys who he's with. It's like, you know, so pass me down the bottle instead. You know, I can't drink her out of my head, boys. I can't drink her out of my head. Right. He's talking about this woman that he was unable to, to, she loved him, but he couldn't love her back. And he's now he's, he's lost. And maybe he's like, maybe the guys he's like, he's in some mining camp somewhere, you know, and he's, made his way up to Alaska or someplace where he's hiding out with these guys and it's at night and they're all drinking and telling their tales of woe to one. I don't know. Maybe that's <laughs> what it is, but I agree with you that it, groove wise, it's pretty funky. And in that kind of sort of like, it's not super fast, but it's super swampy, you know, in that way. And yeah. And John solo on that is pretty incredible. He's a pretty good harmonica player, you know? Yeah. I, I I've been figuring that out over the years. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Jono, for my last question, first off, I've been having such a great time talking with you tonight, but if you had Thanks. to choose Me too. three songs that you've recorded across your entire career that oh, you gee. feel best defines your musical legacy, oh, what God. three songs would you pick and why? Oh, God. <laughs> Save the best for last. That's an awful question to ask somebody. Um <laughs> Which three of my 700 children do I like the best? No, I, um, I know it's a tough one. Well, is that songs of my own or songs by uh, that I've recorded for other artists? Or that... I was mainly speaking songs from your catalog, but if there's a song you wrote that somebody else recorded and you want to include hmm. that by, I mean, there's no rules here. <laughs> yeah. Well, let's say, <laughs> well, going back to like my very, like, early days like the very first song that i recorded in like a bonafide studio where i was the singer on the song was with the worms back in like 1980 and that was a song called one night only and it was the first time that i was like the lead singer and we released that on only on cassette <laughs> and uh that was like you know a pretty important recording for me because it was like the first i mean i'd got i'd made recordings with kid bands that I was in and stuff but this is like the first time we went into like a real studio you know and this is whatever 43 years ago and we did that and I was 18 or 19 years old when we recorded that so that was pretty important to me it's not necessarily the greatest recording that I've ever made but it was a big milestone for me and then moving forward um let me think about it for a minute well let's see this is a really difficult question, Brian. Um, <laughs> you know, because there's so many songs that like have significance for me of course, yeah. for different reasons, you know, because of what they mean to me in terms of marking my life at that time, just like list like listeners do. You know, listeners mm -hmm. listen to a song that brings them back. Oh, the first time I heard Honky Tonk Women that summer that the that that record came out, I was, you know, on the dock at summer vacation and heard that song. And wow, it was, you know, I remember that the smell of the salt air at that time, whatever, you know, but let's see. I'm trying to think of stuff that's more recent, uh, more recent than 45 years ago. <laughs> um, but I mean, certainly some of the tracks on almost home, like the first one's free was also first one's free in a way does connect with cover my hands, you know, because of the way the groove goes, you know, if they're also both in, in, in the key of E and uh, have a very kind of similar swampy groove. They're not the same tune by any means, but but I'd say that one was also a big one for me, just because and that that is the lead off track on that album. And then more recently, the lead off track on my most recent album, "Lights Go Out," is the name of the song. 
currently means a lot to me, although I, I really I like a lot of the songs on my newest album, Stars Enough to Guide Me. And the, the title from of the album comes from that song, Lights Go Out. And basically the song uses a, a, a boxing metaphor. And I wrote that song. I was ha having a particularly difficult couple of days for reasons that I won't go into, just, you know, life shit happening. And I said to myself out loud, I just said, I'm broken. Like this, you know, every once in a while I said, I just, I give up, you know, I am broken. And then the first line of the chorus goes, I am broken. I am reeling. I am knocked down for the count. I am staring at the ceiling, but I won't let the lights go out. In other words, like even at that last moment, you know, and the, the first lines of the song say, you know, always want to come out swinging, never saw the use in holding back. Even when the final bell was ringing, I came on like a heart attack. And that's kind of the story of my life in a lot of ways. You know, I've had a lot of successes, but I've also like been musically and professionally been in the trenches for a long time. I'm still, you know, I'm very lucky to collaborate with the people I do and to have the what notoriety I have, but I'm still just, oh, I'm a working musician. You know, I've always been and I probably always will be. And I don't mind that, you know, but to my story, there's an element of continued like triumph over adversity and not just me. Most, the vast majority of working musicians can relate to this. And even guys who are famous, you know, I mean, look, we were talking about John before we came on and how he's like had at the end of his the, the last tour struggling with problems with his voice. And so there's always something that you have to overcome. You know, and so in this business, no matter what level you're at. And so that song resonates with me at this point in my life. And the the idea for that song, I heard an interview on the radio. I can't remember who the guy was, but they were, I was and driving in the car was an NPR with some boxer who had held a title like a light or middleweight title, but also held a record for being the title holder who had been knocked down in the ring the most time. But his thing was like, well, as long as you get up one more time than you've been knocked down, you still stand a chance of winning, you know, and that really stuck with me. It's like wow. doesn't matter in life or in your professional career or whatever you get knocked down. And that's the bridge of that song says, you know, knocked down two times, stood up three. Ain't nobody get the better of me. Knocked down nine. But I stood up 10 and I'm ready to go all over again. So it's like. Doesn't matter if you've been knocked down nine times, as long as you stand up 10 times, you're in their game. And so that's life, not just for me, but for all of us in a nutshell. You know, it doesn't matter if you get battered around, as long as you get back on your feet, you got a chance. Absolutely inspiring. John O'Manson, this has truly been a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me tonight on my weekly mixtape. Thanks for having me, man. It's fun to talk to you and, and your questions were excellent and insightful. So I really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. And remember, you can head to myweeklymixtape.com to hear all the songs we've talked about tonight via the playlist embedded on the episode page, along with checking out the full catalog of My Weekly Mixtape episodes. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, you can help me out by either telling a friend, leaving a five-star review wherever you're tuning in, or becoming a Patreon mixtaper at patreon.com forward slash myweeklymixtape. That's all for this week. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, enjoy the tunes. Hey, folks, Stefan Shirazi and Renee Richardson here from the Metallica Report. And we are proud members of the Pantheon podcast family, where the best of music and podcasts unite. We've got something pretty cool for you. We're giving away an exclusive Metallica merch package worth over $250. That's a whole lot of scary guys, skulls, M72, and other sought-after Metallica swag. And we've made it easy for you to win. Follow and share the Metallica Report. And you're in the game. Go to pantheonpodcast.com slash Metallica, enter your email, and hit that button to be entered to win. And just like that, you're eligible for our monthly exclusive Metallica merch package. And guess what, rockers? You can enter every month. So just do it. And while we love our global brothers and sisters, the lawyers won't let us ship outside the U.S.